Well, good evening, everybody. Tonight we're going to be going over another sutta in the Majima Nikaya, uh, Majima Nikaya MN51 uh, to Khandaraka. Okay, so tonight we're going to be doing a, a sutta in the Majima Nikaya MN51 uh, to Khandaraka. Uh, Khandaraka. So this is going to be another narrative uh, kind of sutta. It's a discourse uh, that the Buddha gave to a wanderer and uh, one of his followers. Uh, this is going to be a little, this is the ninth day of retreat here. So we're going to be talking about some, some uh, different topics and kind of opening up our conversation here. Uh, other kinds of meditation objects and other information about the process. Uh, when Bhante V. Mularamsi gave talks, uh, well, back in the mid-2000s or late 2000s, there, we were not recording them as frequently. Uh, we didn't have phones that worked so well. It was clunky video cameras and so on, uh, if any of you remember that. Yeah. And, and so there was a lot of talks that were given that we just didn't record. Back in those days, back, way back then, there was, you know, retreats for one or four people. They were smaller. We were down in the A-frame there, uh, all in the, the small Dhamma hall, and uh, talks could last 6 o'clock, 6.15 to 9, 9.30. Um, they could be quite long, um, and Bonte would cover quite a bit of information there. Uh, his time as a monk, his travels in Asia, how he came to the conclusions uh, to discussed to him uh, lots of commentary on different meditation processes and objects. And um, since you are all doing so well and really understand what you're doing with your meditation uh, object right now, and because of the stupid dedication tomorrow, I thought we should open this up a little bit and yeah, talk, talk more, more about the things that, um, that he would frequently talk about in those days. Twim over the years, like everything, has become more evolved and refined over time. Uh, but some of this information doesn't get talked much about much. So I thought it would be fun. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at uh, Kampa on the banks of uh, Gagara Lake with a large sangha of monks. Then Pesa, the elephant driver's son, and Kandaraka, the wanderer, went to the Blessed One. Pesa, after paying homage to the Blessed One, sat down at one side, while Kandaraka exchanged greetings with the Blessed One. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side. This means he, uh, while was respectful uh, to the Buddha, was, he was not a follower or a student of him. He was there to uh, discuss things with the Buddha, maybe talk the Dhamma, but was not a, not a disciple. Standing there, he surveyed the Sangha of monks uh, sitting in complete silence. And then he said to the Blessed One, It is wonderful, Master Gotama. It is marvelous how the Sangha of monks have been led to practice the right way by Master Gotama. Those who were blessed ones, accomplished and fully lightened in the past, at most led the Sangha of monks to practice the right way as is done by Master Gotama now. And those who will be blessed ones, accomplished and fully enlightened in the future, at most will only lead the Sangha of monks to practice the right way as it is done by Master Gotama now. So what Khandaraka saw was a large assembly of monks, um, uh, several hundred, uh, all sitting there motionless, uh, not moving, not restless, not clearing their throats, uh, just sitting there calm, observing. That must have been incredibly uh, impressive to see. Uh, this particular group of monks were all uh, arahats or in training to be arahats on the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, so it was a group of well-trained monks. So it is, Kandaraka, so it is. Those who were blessed ones accomplished and fully enlightened in the past, at most, only led the Sangha of monks to practice the right way as, done, as is done by me now. And those who will be blessed ones accomplished and fully enlightened in the future, 
at most will only lead the Sangha of monks to practice the right way as it is done by me now. And you notice they're talking about blessed ones of the past and future there. So, as I said uh, earlier in the retreat, the idea is the Dhamma is not invented, it is rediscovered. And a Buddha is one who is able to rediscover the Dhamma after it has been lost for a period of time. So it's not an invention of a single person, it's a discovery of a, of a natural law or universal process uh, that um, all uh, sentient beings engage in like that. So there's stories of past and future Buddhas that are in the suttas, um, but, but that, uh, that's what that's referring to there. Poor Khandaraka, in this Sangha of monks, there are monks who are arahats with, with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and who are completely liberated through final knowledge. And in this Sangha of monks, there are monks in higher training of constant virtue, living a life of constant virtue, sagacious, living a life of constant uh, sagacity. They abide with their minds well established in the four foundations of mindfulness. Here, Khandaraka, a monk abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetous and grief for the world. He abides contemplating feelings as feeling, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief, grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. So he's talking about the four foundations of mindfulness, uh, or the four satipatthanas. Uh, satipatthana, um, I think we can uh, describe that word sati as the first part of the word that means mindfulness, and patana, um, uh, foundation or maybe establishment. So four ways mindfulness is established, four uh, modes, four foundations of mindfulness. We find this uh, described in detail in the Satipatthana suttas. Uh, there's one in the long discourses and there's one in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's a little shorter. So the Satipatthana sutta is really a beloved uh, sutta worldwide. Uh, this is chanted every day by many, many people. Um, uh, this approach is incredibly popular and talked about. Uh, the four Satipatthanas are broken down into body, feeling, mind, and mind objects. And they're used as objects or focuses of meditation. There are many approaches for utilizing the Satipatthanas. Um, but we can say the Satipatthanas when arahats talk about how they abide, how they spend their time and how they hold their mind, they frequently say they, they abide with the four satipatthanas uh, that we find that many places in the text. Um, it's frequently talked about in dry insight or straight vipassana practices. Uh, uh, Babante was clear in his commentary uh, that this was actually a description of, of jhana practice and the way one can go through it is very much how we practice in TWIM, uh, naturally going through these different contemplations. So the first satipatthana are contemplations of the body. It starts out with instructions for breath meditation, uh, which is simply being aware as you breathe in and being aware as you breathe out uh, and how you breathe and tranquilizing your body as you breathe in and out. And it evolves uh, with a couple of other, other instructions with that. And so it's talking about the breath as a meditation object. So meditation objects are home bases 
or focuses for developing our samatha and vipassana, helping our mind refine its awareness, and we observe them and follow along with them. Whatever <coughs> meditation object you're using, uh, with, I'm not sure any variation in Buddhism, uh, ultimately they lead to the same culmination which is leading to disenchantment, dispassion, and cessation, and ultimately the experience of nirvana. So whatever the process of the meditation object, they will culminate uh, in that process if one is following the Eightfold Path. But they all have different side effects and effects. Uh, they work better with different personalities or not, maybe, uh, or that's what's written. Uh, different antidotes to different states. And some of them are uh, quite different than working as we, as we do with loving-kindness and metta. So working with loving-kindness and metta, uh, this is, of course, uh, a process. You start with loving-kindness and it evolves into compassion and joy and equanimity. We start by attending to loving-kindness and we uh, observe the movements of our mind's attention as it goes away from the object. When, uh, when we lose our attention, we 6R. 6R, relax, smile, and come back. As we start working with this, initially we enter the first jhana, and we start letting go of everything. We start with letting go of the hindrances. As we go deeper, we let go of joy, and then we even let go of the sensations of our body. As you know, we are not achieving something or attaining a state. We're revealing what's there by letting go of uh, our defilements, our bad habits, our distractions, one by one. Um, loving kindness practice will take us as far as nothingness. So loving kindness takes us to the first jhana, and then it effortlessly automatically changes into compassion, which takes us to, through infinite space, to joy through infinite consciousness, and then equanimity through, uh, through nothingness. Sometimes we go through these phases rather quickly, and sometimes we go through them uh, more methodically. It's just whatever your mind wants to do. Um, as you can let go easier and easier, you'll go even beyond equanimity. Uh, go into neither perception nor non-perception. Uh, nearly all meditation objects will only take you to neither perception nor non-perception, uh, with some exceptions. The way you have uh, trained your mind uh, and allowed it to go deeper and deeper becomes an automatic process in either perception or non-perception as we drop even uh, equanimity that naturally falls away and we rest in our mind. Neither perception nor non-perception is a large process. It's the large jhana actually, as you all are finding. We start uh, letting go of equanimity automatically and mind rests rests in calm. When we try to bring up equanimity, it brings up tension and tightness, and so we naturally just want to rest. As we rest longer, uh, there can be periods where, well, it's neither perception nor non-perception. Perception becomes less present and acts differently. We may have trouble remembering a function of perception. It may be dreamlike. We may have little stories something colors and we find ourselves coming out of that back to a clear awareness back into stillness and we can find our energy is higher at this point uh, mind is more alert um, but it can be a surprise what happened did i get dull did i fall asleep was that dullness uh oh kind of like when the joy goes away at the second jhana this can be a place of confusion unless we're aware of this, and we may try to reach back and try to bring up loving kindness, try to bring equanimity and bring more tension and restless to our mind, restlessness to our mind. Instead, uh, just enjoy the quiet and rest in still mind. 
uh, as it goes from quiet mind into more still alert mind. Sometimes we go back into that dreamy neither perception or non-perception and we find ourselves coming out again. That's fine. How do you know it's not dullness? When you come out, you're clear and alert and present. Now, still mind is another one of those times where we may think something is wrong because our mind is so clear and alert, but it can be so present and ordinary. All of our deep states of meditation, suddenly we find ourselves present, clear, in the room, what happened? But if we look and notice, our mind is still. It is not thinking of things. It is not moving back and forth. It is just present there. So we stay there in the quiet and we go deeper. Now mind is tricky. Sometimes in this place, mind gets bored or it thinks anything but being perfectly still. Oh, it's great for a couple minutes, but anything but that. And it starts, maybe I'll get up. Oh, maybe it's time to get up now. Oh, maybe something's wrong. Uh-oh, right? Yep, sounds familiar. Uh, and so, no, just a trick of mind. Mind is tricky. So just relax and stay there and enjoy the quiet and enjoy the stillness because it's lovely. And when you're like this deep, you see things come up, subtle things come up, and you see that they are not as much fun as being still and present. So they come up and you 6R and you relax. And as you go, as you go deeper, maybe you don't even 6R, maybe you just relax. Maybe you just relax a little bit. Maybe you just relax right before they come up because you know they're about to come up. At some point, uh, there can be a transition. You may not notice this, but sometimes people notice, oh, static or lights or something, a feeling of sinking as you go deeper again. When this happens, just relax. In mind, it gets exquisitely quiet sometimes. In this, uh, we're talking about the signless now, even the relaxed step is too much effort. You can just allow yourself to notice the distraction and you watch it arise and go away. And there's no craving or tension in the wake. The craving just arises and goes away. Little tiny movement, little tiny craving until there can be long moments where nothing arises. By now, it's uh, clear, it's exquisite silence, and it's quite lovely. So you just enjoy. Anything that comes up, you just observe and let go. And if you observe it about to come up, just observe that and let it go. And that's how we work with the Brahma Viharas and loving kindness. An advantage of loving kindness is it is pleasant. It's fun to, uh, it's enjoyable and pleasant to bring up loving kindness. It's a pleasant feeling at first. And this allows mind to be more interested in it. And it's a feeling. So it becomes more subtle the deeper we go. So the deeper we go, the more we automatically refine our enlightenment factors and automatically get more and more balance in our mind. It can be a very fast process. Um, and, and this is why this is a primary method uh, we, we recommend in TWIM, because it seems to work for nearly everybody, and it is a fast, pleasant method. Loving kindness is an antidote for ill will. Um, the Brahma Vihara's antidotes for cruelty, for jealousy, for aversion and lust. Naturally, uh, these will help help this bring this balance in our mind. And loving kindness is warm. Uh, there's an obscure sutta or two that brings up, uh, loving kindness helps you in, in cold climates. Um, and it brings warmth to the body. 
I don't think it overheats you in hot climates. Uh, but no, sutas clearly say that. And I'm from Minnesota, where the winters, we can have four to six weeks of minus zero degrees Fahrenheit in a row, right? It gets a little chilly up there sometimes. So meditation, loving kindness groups, where you have a lot of people in the room, 10, 20 people, uh, after the practice, people comment. It gets warmer. It gets warmer just doing that. Uh, it's a good thing when you're out in the cold to have loving kindness. Uh, yep, have loving kindness in your heart and your body. It does help. Um, so that's how loving kindness is. That's so, some details about it. The breath is another very popular meditation object. We also find it in the suttas, um, and it's the first stage of the satipatthanas. The breath is different uh, than loving kindness. The breath is very uh, calm and smooth. Um, it's a very neutral object. Loving kindness is positive and pleasant. The breath is neutral, and this this can be lovely too. Um, but it is used in every way we use loving kindness, although it's a little trickier to work with. Um, I have used the breath uh, as an object for a couple of years to learn it. Uh, and many people uh, have bad habits with the breath. We, we learn the breath first. Uh, and so when we learn the breath, we often uh, get uh, internally fixated on it or we attend a little too intensely on it. And so we, it's difficult to, to develop uh, jhana that is not internally stuck or, or distracted with it. It's a bad habit that can develop. But when you, know, when you just allow it to be there and relax as you breathe in and relax as you breathe out, it will take you through the jhanas in the same way as loving kindness does. And so the first uh, satipatthana is working with the breath. Um, and so developing uh, perhaps uh, jhana there. The next description in Satipatthana is postures, uh, like we talked about, sitting, standing, laying down, and walking, uh, the, the four postures, and talking about acting and moving in full awareness. Sounding familiar, yeah? What you do, you act with full awareness, whatever you're doing. Um, whether you're walking here or there, eating, showering, or so on, uh, bringing full awareness to what you're doing. And then the next is uh, a body part contemplation. Uh, so this is working with the component parts of the body, the intestines, the bones, the fingernails, and so on. And looking at the body in terms of its component parts brings equanimity. It brings clarity. You break apart the formation of the body and just see it in terms of its parts. We, uh, I often think all medical students should certainly be taught meditation. Uh, people who do gross anatomy and learn physiology should think about this, should think about the fact that they have a large intestine and there it is and they're made up of bones and so on, made up of muscles and sinew. It brings the perception of impermanence and disidentification with the body. Sure, our body is there, but it is not me, right? We can take parts of our body away and we are still here. So uh, that is, then the next is working with the elements, um, working with hardness, cohesion, movement, and heat. Again, breaking apart the experience of our body. And the last one we haven't talked about, which is eternal ground meditation, um, which is watching, again, developing impermanence in the body. It used to be that uh, uh, bodies were burned or they were taken to eternal ground for animals uh, to eat or them decompose safely away from villages and so on. And so this was, a, this was a meditation that people would do, is go out to the charnel ground and live and spend time there. Um, so it would be uh, get over their fear, get over their fear of being there, um, and to learn to observe the body as not, not them, not me. And again, when you're doing gross anatomy, when you're watching things be taken apart, you see, you see muscle, you see what it looks like, 
you see as it is broken down to just a skeleton. And that is, that is how that uh, contemplation is talked about. Bonte talked about several projects over the years to bring this information to people, uh, people trying to donate their, their uh, corpse so it could be videotaped. And so these stages of decomposition could be observed by people because we don't have access to this mostly now. Um, this never came to fruition as I know, as, I, as far as I know, but you can look online and look at, um, look at gross anatomy courses on YouTube. It is absolutely available uh, to just, just Google it. And this information is available if you, if you dare. As I understood, these, these, uh, these uh, meditations were used to generate the first, uh, perhaps up to the third jhana, like that, and then people would move on, and that's what Bonte said about that. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't go through deeper states up to neither perception or non-perception by uh, working with component parts or, um, or the charnel ground. Though I suspect uh, elements could take you quite deep, uh, actually. So that is uh, the first satipatthana, uh, is body. And then feeling, uh, you know, feeling, eye feeling, nose feeling, pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful, as we've been talking about. Mind, objects, and thoughts. Um, so these, these can be uh, talked about going individually, systematically through them, or uh, as one develops a stability on any meditation object, knowing these, one naturally will start to ob observe them in time, and one will naturally uh, go through the satipatthanas, whether you know it or not. Uh, that was, that was Bhante's commentary on that practice. When this was said, Pessa, the elephant driver's son, said, It is wonderful, venerable sir. It is marvelous how well the four foundations of mindfulness have been made known by the Blessed One for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way and the realization of Nibbana. For venerable sir, we white clothed lay people also from time to time abide with our minds well established in these four foundations of mindfulness. Here, venerable sir, we abide contemplating the body as a body, feelings as feelings, mind as mind, mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. It is wonder, venerable sir, it is marvelous how amidst man's tangle of corruption and deceptions, the blessed one knows the welfare and harm of beings. For humankind is a tangle, but the animal is open enough. Venerable sir, I can drive an elephant to be tamed. In the time it would take to make the trip back and forth in Kampa, that elephant will show every kind of deception, duplicity, crookedness, and fraud he is capable of. But those who are called our slaves, messengers, and servants behave in one way with the body, another way by speech, while their minds work still in another way. It is wonderful, venerable sir, it is marvelous how amidst tangles, corruption, and deceptions the Blessed One knows the welfare and harm of beings. For humankind is a tangle, but the animal is open enough. Open enough. So that simile is pretty clear. Um, even working with an elephant, a very intelligent being, um, uh, will resist openly, resist clearly in a way that can be worked with. Um, humans, uh, we're, uh, we're far more slippery. And even with ourselves, we're duplicitous. Even with ourselves, we don't know our thoughts. And even our minds, when we're working with them, they will be tricky. They will be tricky. Anything but being quiet, right? Um, but we have a process for working with our minds, of course. Uh, simply by noticing there is a distraction, we relax, 6R, and for a moment, mind is clear. And we have a reference point to see. Uh, so it is, Pessa, so it is. Humankind is a tangle, but the animal is open enough. Pessa, there are four kinds of persons to be found existing in the world. What for? 
Here, a certain kind of person torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself. Here, a certain kind of person torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others. Here, a certain kind of person torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself. And he also torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others. Here, a certain kind of person does not torment himself or pursue the practice of torturing himself. And he does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others. Since he torments neither himself nor others, he is here and now hungerless, extinguished, and cooled. He abides experiencing bliss, having himself become holy. Which of these four kinds of persons satisfies your mind, Pesa? Hmm. The first three do not satisfy my mind, venerable sir, but the last one satisfies my mind. But Pesa, why don't the first three kinds of persons satisfy your mind? Venerable Sir, the kind of person who torments himself and pursues the practice of tor torturing himself, torments and tortures himself, though he desires pleasure and recoils from pain, that is why this kind of person does not satisfy my mind. And the kind of person who torments, who tortures others and pursues the practice of torturing others, torments and tortures others who desire pleasure and recoil from pain, that is why this kind of person does not satisfy my mind. And the kind of person who torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself, and who also torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others, torments and tortures himself and others, both of whom desire pleasure and recoil from pain, that is why this kind of person does not satisfy my mind. But the kind of person who does not torment himself or pursue the practice of torturing himself, and who does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others who, since he torments neither himself nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished, and cooled, and abides experiencing bliss, having himself become holy. He does not torment and torture either himself or others, both of whom who desire pleasure and recoil from pain. That is why this kind of person satisfies my mind. And now, Venerable Sir, we depart. We are busy and we have much to do. You may go, Pessa, at your own convenience. Then Pessa, the elephant driver's son, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One words, rose from the seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed. Soon after he left, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, Pessa, the elephant driver's son, is wise. He has great wisdom. If he had sat a while longer until I expounded for him in detail these four kinds of persons, he would have greatly benefited. Since he has already, since still he has already greatly benefited, even as it is. So the idea is, if he had stayed, he would have uh, achieved a, a, a stage of awakening, would have become a sotapanna. So in the suttas, there are many, many descriptions of people listening to Dhamma talks and attaining the first or even second stage of awakening through the Dhamma talks, uh, through simply listening. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, you know, the Buddha would be invited to lunch and he would give a talk and everyone in attendance would, uh, would attain stream entry. Um, so uh, that, that says a lot about what it must have been like to be in the presence of the Buddha and the kind of karma one must have to, to be born in that time, to be like that. Um, for karma prepares your mind for that, um, simply. It is the time, Blessed One, it is the time, Sublime One, for the Blessed One to expound in detail these four kinds of persons. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then. Monks, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said this. Monks, what kind of person torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself? Here a certain person goes naked, rejecting conventions, licking his hands, not coming with asked when asked, not stopping when asked. He does not accept food or brought food brought or food specifically made or an invitation to a meal. He receives nothing from a pot, from a bowl, across a, across a threshold, across a stick, 
across a pestle, from two eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food is advertised to be distributed, from where a dog is waiting for where flies are buzzing, he accepts no fish or meat, he drinks no liquor, wine, or fermented brew. He keeps to one house, to one morsel. He keeps to two houses, to two morsels, up to seven houses, to seven morsels. He lives on one saucerful a day, two saucerfuls a day, on up to seven saucerfuls a day. He takes food once a day, once every two days, once every seven days. Thus, even up to once a fortnight, he dwells pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. So this is talking about aesthetic practices, uh, which were popular in the time of the Buddha, which the Buddha himself uh, uh, did. And so this is basically removing uh, ability to have food and eating less and less. This, of course, is not sustainable. Uh, the Buddha took it as far as he could be and um, nearly died. And, and people who practice this, as I understand it, will, will eat sometimes. And so they can't do this forever. This is not a practice that can be done. So periods of emaciation and, and starvation and then part, periods of eating a great deal. Uh, so going back and forth between the two to build up only to starve oneself again. That's a stressful way to live and a stressful way on your body. That is, that's very challenging. That's torturing yourself. That is people, yeah, <laughs> not recommended. He is an eater of greens or millet or wild rice or hide parings or moss or ripe rice bran or rice scum or sesame flour or grass or cow dung. Uh, he lives on forest roots and fruits. He feeds on fallen fruits. He clothes himself in hemp and hemp uh, mixed cloth and shrouds and refuse rags and tree bark and antelope hide and strips of antelope hide and kusa grass fabric, which is a, a very sharp kind of grass, uncomfortable in bark fabric, in wood shavings fabric, in head hair wool, in animal wool, in owl's wings. He's one who pulls out hair and beard, pursuing the practice of pulling out hair and beard. He's one who squats continuously, rejecting seats. He's one who uh, squats continuously, devoted to the maintenance of a squatting position. So these are all practices that were done. It's pretty nice. We know not to do them. Um, there are uh, these squatting positions or uh, holding positions. There are practices where people hold their arm above their head and will do that for years and years until the bones become fused and the shoulder will not move. Um, these are extreme aesthetic practices and more I won't talk about. Um, in the pursuit for awakening, people will do whatever they think it, they need to uh, when they're really devoted. Um, that is definitely true. He is one who uses a mattress of spikes. He makes a mattress of spikes in his bed. He dwells pursuing the practice of bathing in water three times a day, including the evening. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but the belief was this would, uh, this would induce illness and death, um, uh, uh, bathing in the evening. Uh, and certainly bathing in the Ganges is a brave thing to do these days too. Um, but people do. Um, Thus, in every variety of ways, he dwells pursuing the practice of tormenting and mortifying the body. This is the kind of a person who torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself. So, extreme ascetic practices. Uh, in Buddhism, though, there are ascetic practices that, uh, that some people do follow. Um, and they are not, uh, not intended to be harmful for oneself, but intended to increase mindfulness and increase one's comfort wherever one is. Um, these are practices uh, mostly around eating, uh, ways of eating, um, working with the bowl, where one dwells, how one dwells. Uh, so living in the woods with limited, uh, limited supports, and then a practice of not laying down um, ever. Uh, and so that, that's a, a pretty wild one. So people start practicing. Uh, by leaning against things and sleeping, um, sitting in a chair and sleeping, and eventually sitting cross-legged in the center of room uh, for decades and sleeping that way or not sleeping that way as their meditation increases. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so th these, of course, require 
uh, special training and teachers to do all of these, I mean, but there are people who still do these practices today. Um, and so Mahakasapa was one of the great disciples of the Buddha who was foremost in these kinds of practices. Um, when the Buddha passed, he was one who uh, stepped up as, as uh, kind of a, 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 an authority figure, a director, while the Sangha was uh, figuring things out during that transition period. Not, not what he really wanted to do, I know, but that was how his mind was. He, his suttas are so precise and direct, um, and he has no problem saying exactly what he thinks to anyone. Of, of course, not, not, not mean or cruel, but very precise. Um, Mahakasapa has some great quotes, uh, like when he was 85, he was still climbing mountains and living on his own in the mountains in the cold. And people asked him, Mahakasapa, why are you still climbing mountains? You're 85. Why are you still meditating so intensely like this? And he answered, because I can, because this is the Buddha's teaching with the energy of the teaching of the Buddha, I can. And this is much better. This is a pleasant abiding uh, there for, for him uh, with, with working with the elements and environment the way he did. Plenty of stories of him being offered wonderful housing uh, by kings and nobles and so on. He was absolutely not. He would prefer to live outside on his own, uh, performing austerities. Uh, yep, a very, very interesting uh, great disciple. What kind of person's monks torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others? Here a certain person is a butcher of a sheep, butcher of pigs, a fowler, a trapper of wild beasts, a hunter, a fisherman, a thief, an executioner, a prison warden, or one who follows any other such bloody occupation. This is called the kind of person who torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others. Uh, so these are professions that involve uh, killing or professions that involve causing harm to others. And as we talked about last night, these can be sources of dark karma. Um, but there is another uh, well-known disciple, uh, Angulimala, uh, who is an interesting case. Angulimala was a murderer. He was a, he was a mass murderer, actually. Um, he was he was a, a rather impressive individual, and in, he was a spiritual disciple of another sect. And the teacher, for various reasons in uh, you know, things that were said, was, became paranoid of him. And so he said, Angulimala uh, on a quest uh, to kill 1,000 people. And I, that was his way, perhaps, of getting rid of him and uh, the imagined threat. So Angulimala, instead of getting caught or killed or whatever, succeeded and killed 999 people and collected their fingers on a necklace. Pretty gruesome. Um, the 1,000th person was the Buddha. Um, and when he, went to, uh, when he went to kill the Buddha, the Buddha easily vested him, uh, not with violence, uh, but with his mind. And Angulimala was fortunately converted to Buddhism by how impressed he was with the Buddha. Um, and Angulimala was practiced, uh, practiced, became a monk, and became an arahat. Uh, but of course, dark kama is dark kama, and so the story of Angulimala it had a terrible time in alms round, um, a terrible time with his fellow monks, um, and did suffer greatly until he became an arahat. Um, so the, I mean, it is never too late. It is never too late to to work on yourself. Is, is really the takeaway there. Um, what kind of person monks torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself and also torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others? Here some person is a head anointed noble king or a well-to-do Brahmin, having had a new sacrificial temple built to the east of the city, having shaved off his hair and beard, dressed himself in rough hide and greased his body with ghee and oil, Scratching his back with a deer's horn, he enters the sacrificial temple together with his chief queen and his Brahmin high priest. 
<clears throat> there he lays down on the bare ground strewn with grass. The king lives on the milk of the first teat of the cow with the calf of the same color, or the chief queen lives on the milk of the teat, the second teat, and the Brahmin high priest lives on the milk of the third teat. The milk of the fourth teat they pour onto the fire, and the calf lives on what is left. He says thus, let so many bulls be sacrificed, slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many bullocks be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many heifers be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many goats be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many sheep be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many trees be felled for the sacrificial, sacrificial posts. Let so much grass be cut for the sacrificial grass. And then his slaves, messengers, and servants make preparations weeping with fearful faces, being spurred on by threats of punishment and fear. This is the kind of person who torments himself and pursues the practice of torturing himself and torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others. So I don't understand that practice very well, uh, but it seems to be referring to a kind of tradition of sacrifice uh, at the time. And I think the takeaway there is that is a practice that is wasteful and harmful, um, dangerous to the people conducing it, and harmful to the environment and the community like that. And so uh, that is not recommended uh, to pursue one's awakening uh, at the expense of others, at the expense of the environment, at the expense of the community um, like that. And what kind of person, monks, does not torture himself or pursue the practice of torturing himself and does not torment others or pursue the practice of tormenting others? The one who, since he torments neither himself nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled, abides experiencing bliss, having himself become holy. Here, monks, the Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, supply and knower of worlds, uncomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its Maras, and its Brahmins, the generation with its recluses and Brahmins, its princes and people, which he himself has realized by direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. With right meaning and phrasing, he reveals the holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. And that's a marvelous quality of the Dhamma, uh, that one starts it, one gets benefit. In the middle, as and there are stages of practice, right? Uh, one practice is a little different in the middle and the end, and in every stage, uh, it is fantastic with great benefit. And so now, now we'll be reading a page or two. Uh, so enjoy it. This is, uh, this is found in many suttas. It's talking about the process of uh, entering monastic life and de developing the jhanas. A householder or householder's son or one born of some other clan hears that dhamma. On hearing the dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considers thus. Household life is crooked and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into the homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning a small or large fortune, abandoning a small or large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe, and goes forth from the home into homelessness. Having gone forth and possessing the monk's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciless, merciful, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning what is taken of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Taking only what is given, expecting only what is given, by not stealing, he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy. Living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable. One who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these, 
nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus he is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. At the right time, he speaks such words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only one meal a day, abstaining from eating at night and outside of the proper time. He abstains from dancing, singing, music, and theatrical shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, smartening himself with scent, embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and large couches. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. He abstains from, he abstains from accepting men and women slaves. He abstains from accepting goats and sheep. He abstains from accepting fowl and pigs. He abstains from accepting elephant, cattle, horses, and mares. Doesn't say anything about cats and dogs. <laughs> he abstains from accepting field and lands. He abstains from going on errands and running messages. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from false weights, false metals, and false measures. He abstains from accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding, and trickery. He abstains from wounding, murdering, binding, brigandage, blunder, plunder, and violence. He, built, he comes content with robes to protect his body and with alms food to make it, maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with his wings as its only burden, so too the bhikkhu becomes content with robes to protect his body and with alms food to maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, he, exp he experiences with him himself a bliss that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs as features. Since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of restraint. He guards the eye faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tangibles, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the mind, with, with the, touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, he does not grasp at his signs and features, since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices a way of restraint, he guards the mind faculty, he understands the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing the noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied. So we're talking about the development of sila, the development of generosity leading, leading to bliss and calm. And with that as a basis, working with the sense faculties as we do. Um, not following things, not thinking about things, observing and allowing mind not to think. This mind starts to follow one, simply six hours in this present. As we talked about the development of uh, the sense bases, it starts with effort and it becomes easier and easier. Just like as you go deeper in your meditation, it becomes easier and more effortless to 6R. We start catching ourselves far away, catching ourselves a little closer at one word, at one thought. And then as we go deeper, the 6Rs come up automatically. We let them come up automatically. We let our attention uh, simply guide the process. We don't try. Trying brings a headache. We allow mind to do what it does automatically. At this point in the retreat, your mind knows what to do. Any kind of trying or effort will bring a headache <coughs> and tension. 
So just let it rest and let your mind go to distraction and relax in 6R. Or let it go to distraction and relax and let it go away. Or just let the, let the craving be known and pass naturally, automatically, effortlessly. He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his ling, limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating and drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. Full awareness of what? Full awareness of the movements of mind's attention. And this is the same text that we find in the Satipatthana Suttas. Possessing this noble aggregate of noble virtue and this noble restraint of faculties, possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resorts to a secluded resting place, uh, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. On returning from his alms round, after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with the mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with the mind free from ill will. Compassionate for the welfare of all living beings, he purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor. Percipient of light, mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, he remains abides unagitated with the mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt. Unperplexed about wholesome states, he purifies his mind from doubt. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And he enters it by letting go of the hindrances and allowing them to pass with mindfulness. Letting go. Each jhana is a stage of simply letting go. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with joy and happiness born of, of collectedness. Again, with the fading away of joy, he abides in equanimity, mindfully and fully aware. Still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which the noble ones announce. He has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. Again, with the abandonment of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, malleable, wieldly, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the past, recollection of past lives. So imperturbability is another way of talking about the fourth jhana and resting in the fourth jhana in a solid way with not moving beyond to the Arupa jhanas. From here, he directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, that is one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 20, 50, a thousand, a hundred thousand, many aeons of world contraction, many aeons of world expansion, many aeons of world contraction and expansion. There I was so named to such a clan, of such appearance, such was my nutriment. 
such my experience of pleasure and pain and my lifespan. Passing away from there, I reappeared here into I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance. Such was my nutriment, such was my experience of pleasure and pain. Such my life term, passing away from here, I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects manifold past lives. So this is talking about the past life meditation. So from the fourth jhana, there are three main uh, paths of development that people may take on their way to cessation. Um, one path is the path of the jhanas and going through the Avery jhanas as we talk about here. This is a straightforward path that is appropriate for nearly everyone. And nearly everyone finds it very uh, simple and straightforward to go through this path. One of the advantages of going this way is a great mental collectedness and stability one develops going through this. Um, but there's two other routes that people tend to take based on their inclination of mind. People uh, can be said to be thought of as more feeling-based or more sensitive to feeling or more sensitive to um, intellect or a mix of the both. Um, when uh, one becomes sensitive to feeling, one can find feelings overwhelming and as one becomes collected, one can be really uh, have a lot of different kinds of things come up in their meditation that really makes it more necessary for them to focus on following these things. Um, these are intuitive processes. Um, some of the mundane processes uh, are talked about like divine eye or so on. Uh, working with extra sensory perception kind of stuff. This is the most difficult and slow and dangerous path. Um, it is really, for one, as Bonte talked about, only one who doesn't have another choice. Um, it requires great mentorship. Um, and Bonte said he uh, would potentially teach someone this route, but would require they live with him for five or ten years to really see how stable they were before I would do that. That's, that's how we talked about that. So as you read the suttas, you'll talk about that kind of path. The other kind of path uh, that is talked about is the recollection of past lives. And this is a meditation that um, used to be taught with some frequency by Bhante. Not very often, but for people that did have the mix of feeling and sensitivity to feeling and intellectual uh, sensitivity, he would teach that as well. So I'll talk a little bit about this because you're going to find it in the suttas. My first takeaway with these uh, kinds of meditations is they are very normal and they are very procedural. Um, these kinds of practices are skill development. Anyone who has sensitivity to feeling can develop these meditations. It's not a special person that does. Um, there are, as, as just as some people are more skilled with jhanas and so on, some people uh, do have trouble with this, overthinking things and intellectualizing. But when you hear talk about these things, this is a normal part of human experience. Um, so don't, don't imagine someone who's done this meditation is special and you are not like that. Um, it's a meditation, I mean really, like when we hear things incredible like this, that's, you either get arrogant and dismissive with your worldview or you get the opposite and think it's a really incredible thing that, wow. All of these capacities are natural human capacities uh, like that. Uh, children remember past lives. There's more and more books about past lives. Psychologists use past lives in their practice now. Um, this idea is becoming more and more popular and mainstream. Um, yeah, children remembering past lives is remarkable. Young, young kids frequently do, particularly if you just ask them. Like, don't prompt them, you just ask them. Uh, somewhere between, you know, two and two and five, these sometimes show up. They usually forget about them by seven or eight and, you know, um, and then they move on with their life, which is the idea, move on with your life. Um, but the, the past life meditation is done from the basis of the fourth jhana. Um, it's a quite pleasant meditation. Um, I've had a chance to do it. Many of Bhante's students have done this. Um, 
what was taught taught more frequently it's not really recommended partially because it takes guidance and it's it's disturbing uh too it's not as comfortable as the jhanas as you remember these things um more perception of your life uh is is more more perception of of suffering that has happened is what 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 this is about so how you do the practice um please don't do this of course until after retreat um or something like that um but but the other thing is too this kind of thing shows up um in in deep meditation people sometimes have flashes of memories or things that happen and it's like what was that what 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 did i see there and it's common for these things to 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 show up when one is very open to not to be pursued or followed but can happen so to do the past life meditation practice you simply get to the fourth jhana make a determination not to go higher than the fourth jhana and you remember what happened yesterday and then you remember what happened the day before and you remember what happened the day before that and you go through your life and keep remembering and as you go through this process um it, you may start to notice what is a memory and what is a what is a fantasy what's an image what's a delusion and what's a memory memories arise in a very particular way um a very particular sequence of things that happen when it's a true memory and when it is an imagination and so it's helpful to know this then you keep remembering back and further you remember when you were a kid and even further and then just remember what was before that simple and remember what was before that as one develops this faculty uh one starts to well there's hallucination that can happen and then remarkably memory comes up from that space uh when one gets familiar with it and one starts uh getting familiarity with different memories of different people uh and what one remembers is a couple of things one remembers uh childhood one remembers uh frequently mother uh that's an insight that happens we all have mothers uh and remember that over and over again it's uh everyone had a mom sometimes tragedy happens at a young age but over and over again your mom takes care of you uh this is a reason why it's important to remember your parents and take care of your parents when you remember this uh it yeah it's incredible as you see this over and over again the other thing you remember is your death and you remember the pain and the loss of your death and this is why it's a you need to go to the fourth jhana to do this cuz what what's on the top of your mind in your memories the poignant events the difficult events right these things and that's the first thing that comes up painful suffering and tragedy and death and this is an advantage of doing this practice as well because when these things come up you can 6r and you can let go of these attachments and let go of these things and this is how it's used in psychotherapy as well as a way of learning to let go of things uh like that and as you go through naturally remember this happened uh try to remember your food your name your profession and you go through and keep remembering um the it is like a jhana um it feels different than the rest of the jhanas as you start to do this it's quite pleasant it's quite bright there's light involved in this goes for a certain amount of time and uh until it naturally starts shifting um just like loving kindness shifts to compassion this will shift to uh seeing other beings uh arise and pass away quite naturally uh that you don't uh imagine there's a connection to when his concentrated mind is thus purified bright unblemished rid of imperfection malleable wieldy steady uh and attained to imperturbability he directs it to the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human he sees beings passing away and reappearing inferior and superior fair and ugly fortunate and unfortunate he understands how beings pass on according to their actions thus these worthy beings who were ill conducted in body speech and mind revilers of noble ones wrong in their views giving effect to wrong view in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in a state of deprivation 
in a bad destination, in perdition, even hell. But these worthy beings who are well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in a good destination, even the heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. He understands how beings pass on according to their state. And one starts developing understanding of Kama and how it works in, in a more experiential way uh, that starts to become in it, uh, more obvious and more ingrained in one's bones and experience. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperability, he directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. And so the first two knowledges, not everyone bothers to develop. Um, and one not bothering to develop it, one does not have to have an opinion about it uh, like that. This is a practice that people do, um, and we can say that. It's, it's like that. It's available to anybody uh, with the right balance of mind. Um, but the going through the jhanas are actually, is actually much more pleasant um, and much uh, faster for most people as a practice. But everyone gets to the third knowledge sooner or later, no, no matter the path they do. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperability, he directs it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. He understands as it actually is, this is suffering. He understands as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. He understands as it actually is, this is the cessation of suffering. He understands as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And so this is the directly uh, seeing the Four Noble Truths, attaining noble right view. He understands as it actually is, these are the taints. He understands as it actually is, this is the origin of the taints. He understands as it actually is, this is the cessation of the taints. He understands as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of the taints, and understanding dependent origination and the process thereof. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed, uh, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. And this is where all meditation objects will end up. Um, whatever, whatever route they take, or side effects or benefits they incur along the way. They all lead to, in the, when following the Eightfold Path, to the realization of the Four Noble Truths and to the destruction of the taints. This monk is called the kind of person who does not torment himself or pursue the practice of torturing himself and does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others. The one who, since he torments neither himself nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled, and abides in experiencing bliss, having himself become holy. This is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Well, any questions? As, as uh, the takeaway here is, uh, everything you read about the practices fits together. Uh, we were talking uh, throughout the week about the structure of dependent origination, working with uh, our uh, talking about the aggregates, the sense bases, the enlightenment factors, and how to use utilize them to balance the mind. And you do that with every practice you do. Um, as you get calmer and calmer, you balance your enlightenment factors. Uh, and enter just passion, enter uh, and allow it all to happen. Simple as that. So really, is there any questions? Yeah. Uh, are there any objects that are considered better than others 
for the development of concentration? And uh, if so, could you talk about the relationship between concentration and um, what we do here with meta? Well, uh, concentration can be translated as collectedness. So whenever you hear uh, uh, a twin teacher saying collectedness, it's usually concentration in the text. Um, uh, so, so like that. And what do you mean by concentration? Like do you mean like, um, like Jana? Yeah, I suppose. Like, um, just from my own experience, like I've noticed that you know from other practices, developing faculties to be like very precise with awareness. Um, so, like, does are there are, do all objects lead to that faculty in the same way? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I would say so. Um, working with multiple objects, something you realize is they're all functioning by the sharpness of your faculties and enlightenment factors. Uh, all of them work well or not uh, based on how, how clear your mind is and how well you can work with it. So each object will, will do that and necessitate it. Um, and so a reason one object may be easier for another is simply their faculties uh, tend to be at that time tuned better for that object. But all of them are, that's the mechanism. You're developing your faculties and sharpening it. Um, there, are, there are 40 or 108 or more different meditation objects that are talked about in the text uh, primarily, um, uh, depending on which text you look at. So there's a lot of options uh, like that. Yeah. Most common, uh, breath and loving kindness. And, and you'll see the past life meditation brought up a number of times too. All right, everybody, enjoy your meditation practice tonight. Um, again, the takeaway, this is just pointing you again to uh, letting go, uh, how it all works leading up to that, leading up to the signless, leading up to 6R, follow it, get out of the way. Um, do what you've been doing all week and just uh, let it be effortless. Simple as that. Let's share some merit. The suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas, a mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.